Last winter, I asked my mom how I might approach today's talk. And then she said, this is my mom, when you were a kid, you always loved that outer space stuff and computers. So maybe you want to begin with that. And then she said, you probably want to talk about your injuries. Well, mom knows her son. <laughs> this is really a picture of me in the flash talking about how we might save the earth, save the universe from the bad guys. When I was a child watching television, I watched people ask computers questions and then receive answers. Then I watched them use a starship to, or technology to navigate a starship across the galaxy at the speed of light. I knew that when I grew up, I wanted to work with technology. But going into the sixth grade, I still couldn't read. Finally, a teacher noticed my problem, finally, contacted my mom, took me to the doctor, many visits, and then this led to eye surgery to correct my double vision. This meant that I could finally begin to learn to read, and it also meant that it was time for me to get up and make that happen. My high school career turned out mostly okay, but when I graduated, I still wasn't ready for college. And this was my own fault, because my mom always told me, you have to go to college. So I thought that I would be in good shape going to college. Then I finally did get to go to school, but first I joined the Coast Guard. And a few short years later, I found myself stuck in a low-wage job, raising three children, attending night school. But hey, I mean, that wasn't bad, right? I was taking care of my family, going to school. Then one evening, a driver ran a red light and smashed into my car, leaving me, in the words of my many doctors, 100% permanently and totally disabled. I was lucky, though, because I had good health and disability insurance, which paid for me to get back to school and then eventually to return to work. But I was still totally disabled for over five years. And because of my disability, I lost my job, my house, and almost my dignity. If you've ever needed to apply for welfare, food stamps, or subsidized housing, you get it. I found it to be a humbling and sometimes humiliating experience, but I was extremely grateful for the help I received, and I learned a lot about myself in the process. My body was so broken that it usually took me five minutes just to stand up from a chair. And when I finally was able to get up, I was drenched in sweat. And somehow, I was able to attend college. And then my pain became manageable so that I could restart my life. This meant it was time for me to get back to work. So at this time, I finally rediscovered my love for technology and decided to jump back into the field by studying software engineering. If you've studied software engineering, you know lots of computer programming. I eventually received training in servers, routers, and switches, more computer programming, and, eventually, and today I seem to be focused on data forensics and ethical hacking. I think back sometimes to the technology-free life that I led as a kid, and then compare it to the big role that technology plays in my life today, and it seems like a dream. Think about it. Almost all human knowledge is available to anyone who owns a device that fits into a back pocket. We can learn about anything if we just want to. I can post a picture to Facebook when I'm at the top of a mountain. Many people work from home, and most of us bank and shop online, right? So these are just a few of the good things that technology makes available to us. Unfortunately, along with the good comes the bad. And by the bad, in the context of our discussion today, I mean hackers and crackers. Hacking's been with us forever, it seems. As a matter of fact, in the early 1900s, a hacker figured out how to replace a running Morse code message with his own message. <laughs> So hacking really became a part of our culture in about 1979 when hackers realized that they could manipulate telephone tones to provide themselves with free long distance telephone service, which at the time cost several dollars per minute. Isn't it strange that most of us don't even know what long distance telephone fees are anymore? <laughs> 
We should stop for a second to say that the people we're fighting against aren't just the hackers. We're fighting against another group, and they're commonly referred to as crackers. So hackers may attack us for whatever reason, while crackers are interested in making a profit off of their work. They are money motivated. So crackers might attack us to steal our identity, to use or sell it, to break into our bank account to take our money, or even work to influence the outcome of an election. Hackers, like crackers, can have a lot or just a little technical skill. So then guess what? It happened. About 18 months ago, someone tried to scam my wife, Greta, and me into purchasing a used camper for what seemed to be a good price on Craigslist. The scammer went by the name of Rebecca, and she told us that her husband had just died, leaving her with three small children, and that she just wanted to sell this camper cheap as soon as possible. As you can see, she provided us with what appeared to be an authentic eBay invoice. And then she said, go to the store and go purchase several PayPal gift cards. Scratch to reveal the numbers that are located on the back side. Then take pictures of the exposed numbers. Oh, and finally, email all of that to me. Then she said, fax all of that to eBay because then they'll release the camper to you completing the sale. She called this an eBay quick sale, right? We'd never heard of such a thing either. So my wife, Greta, gets online, does a quick internet search, and finds this ter very tactic to be an online scam. We even found the same image images being used in other scams. So I got busy trying to trick Rebecca into meeting or calling me. I even tried posing as a senior citizen who knew very little about the internet and nothing about making purchases online. But nothing I tried worked, so we finally decided to report the incident to the sheriff and to the FBI. Because scammers often live outside of the United States, and because the authorities receive reports of incidents like this all of the time, we weren't surprised when they weren't able to help us. So I got to thinking, what can I do to stop or discourage people like this from using the internet to successfully shake people down? Especially senior citizens like my mom, who usually have no idea as to the danger that these criminals pose. So after I spent some time thinking and doing online research, I came across three technologies that cybersecurity professionals might consider putting into place or even modifying to identify and capture these criminals. And the three technologies are the watering hole, steganography, and file streaming. Let's use my Craigslist experience to explore how these three technologies might be used to protect us online. File streaming is a technique where we programmatically attach a new file, which I refer to as an appended file, to the end of an existing known good file. For our purposes, the appended file contains computer programming code. And better yet, when we look at the files on a computer screen, they appear as one file. This means that if we send such a file to an attacker and they click to open it, the computer programming code hidden and embedded in the appended file can run automatically. The computer programming code can be used to, to allow us to capture data. Some of the data we can collect is their location, uh, browser information, as well as information about their operating system. This technology already exists and can probably be implemented by anyone with average computer programming skill. One drawback, though, is that its success depends upon the attacker being somewhat unsophisticated in technology. Another technology we might put to work is known as a watering hole. As you probably know, watering holes in the wild are isolated places that every animal in the area must visit to get a drink, right? The key is that to get that drink, the animal must come to the watering hole to get it, usually at great risk. In a technical watering hole scenario, rather than us emailing payment images to the attacker, the attacker is directed to a website to download them. The catch is that when the attacker connects to the website, 
Computer programming code hidden and embedded in the website's homepage can run automatically, allowing us to capture data, the same data that we captured using file streaming. This is just a sampling of some of the data that we can collect. By the way, your browser, whatever device you're using, sends this information to every website that you visit. And the internet protocol, or IP address, is like a complete street address. This means that we can use it to calculate the GPS coordinates of the device associated with that IP address, and you see that on the slides graphic. So we use the IP address to calculate the attacker's location, and then web programming to learn the rest. While this might seem to be a good solution, it assumes that we can entice an attacker to come to our website to gain access to the payment images, which may not always be true. And as before, this technology already exists and can be implemented by anyone with average computer programming school skill. I say that lightly, like anybody can program, right? <laughs> this one drawback is that it also assumes that um, the attacker is somewhat unsophisticated in technology. The last item for today's discussion is based on an old trick known as steganography. Spies have used steganography for a long time to send hidden messages to each other. Steganography is a process, not necessarily a technology where something, usually a message, is hidden or nested inside of something else. Most of us are familiar with Russian nested, sometimes called babushka dolls, right? These are a great example of the use of steganography in the real world. For our purposes, though, steganography is a technology because we embed computer programming code rather than a simple message inside of a file. Okay, so now let's think this through using steganography. The instructor, or, or the attacker, asks for payment images. As before, we take a picture of the exposed numbers. But this time, we embed computer programming code inside of one or all of the images. Next, we email the payment images to the attacker. And then the attacker clicks to open the image, meaning that our computer code, hidden and embedded inside the image file, can run automatically. Unfortunately, this technology is not yet fully developed because for computer programming code embedded inside of an image to run, we need a framework, sometimes called a code handler, to recognize the code and then motivate it to run. So as the concept of embedding computer programming code inside of an image matures, we need to create that framework, the code handler, as well as a workaround for the possibility of antivirus protection software which may be installed on the attacker's PC and might stop our code from running at all. As you can see, we have a number of technologies that are exposed at our disposal that cybersecurity professionals might put to work to stop or discourage online scams. Therefore, the point of our discussion today is to issue a clarion call to action to the global cybersecurity community, me included, to join the effort to further develop watering hole and steganography technologies. Obviously, our goal is to get up and capture these criminals who are probably working at this very minute to create online scams like the one I personally experienced. I believe that as we work together as a global community, that we will develop the tools and technologies that we need to dramatically improve the experience and security of those who live and work online. Lastly, I overcame my disability to become a marathon runner and triathlete, and I was even lucky to complete a sub four hour marathon back in 2013. But then about three years ago, I felt the return of a familiar old enemy in the form of intense sciatic pain running down both of my legs to the tips of my big toes. <laughs> my legs felt like they were literally on fire. Somehow emergency surgery, good family care, and lots of physical therapy helped me to mostly regain my health and I've probably completed some 20 half marathons and as many triathlons since then. My mom um, died about two months ago.
But if there's one thing that she drilled into my head, it was to never give up. I haven't given up quitting to work on my, overcoming my disability, and I will not give up my work to identify and capture these cyber criminals. So let's get up and let's get them.